We're talking about whether or not Islam and democracy are compatible. This after the rise of the Islamist party in Tunisia, following the first free and fair election following the Arab uprisings. We're also going to talk now about uh, Egypt and Libya as well. Um, let's talk a bit about Egypt, because the Muslim Brotherhood, um, who are known to have a much tougher interpretation of Sharia law than our... Uh, the Islamists in Tunisia, for example, they are tipped to win the elections next month. How worrying is that for you? Well, again, here you have a lot of divides, so we should not talk about the Muslim Brotherhood as a whole. Uh, but what is interesting in Tunisia, comparing to Egypt, is that for the first time, the Islamist, an Islamist party won't be in the opposition. I mean, they won't be the opponents. They won't be the one who criticize the West. They won't be the one who are asking for reforms. They won't, I mean, or act, at least uh, uh, from, from an oppo oppositional point of view. Uh, it's quite different in Egypt uh, because the transition has not been made uh, through or within democratic frameworks if I, or institutional frameworks, if I can put it that way. Uh, it will, they, they may... Um, stay uh, uh, attached to this opponent's view and the debate may not be very fruitful uh, and they may just and, and also we are talking about also alliances between a certain uh, a certain um, uh, type of, of Muslim Brotherhood members and the former uh, Mubarak supporters uh, so it's really about again how this Islamist discourse from the Muslim Brotherhood is going to position it itself has just a, a neutral political actor that is making propositions for the Egypt's future, or again has a counter power uh, who, who, who just uh, uh, who is just willing to uh, maintain and preserve its position as a op political opponent. All right, let's uh, bring in Robin Wright again in Washington. Uh, what are your thoughts on Egypt? Did, uh, do you think there's an element of uh, the fact that uh, the Muslim Brotherhood have been the underdog in Egypt for so many years? They've been, you know, barely tolerated, but 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 illegal in in political life. Do you think that that's helping contribute to their popularity? Well, it's one of the few parties that's actually well known at this point. The great disadvantage that many of the protesters have in forming new parties is that they're starting without resources, without experience, without known candidates or known faces, whereas the Muslim Brotherhood has been delivering for decades now. But the key issue as we, all, we discuss what comes next and this critical issue of Islam and democracy is to understand that the elections may not be the most important thing. The most important thing is likely to be the writing of the Constitution. And this is a process that's going to play out in each of these countries for at least a year and potentially longer, and where you're likely to see very severe differences over how much, uh, whether it's Sharia law or Islamic tradition, has in influencing the type of legislation allowed, the kinds of um, bodies that are created. And we saw this play out in Iran, which was, again, a democratic revolution in 1979. And it was during the first year and a half that the revolution was hijacked by the clerics, in part because of the political disorder, the differences over the writing of the Constitution. There were 6,400 amendments offered up, and groups became so angry at each other that two of them began killing others. And there were 27 members of parliament, a president, a prime minister killed during this process. So, and I'm not suggesting this is going to play out in the Arab Spring, but it is a divisive process. And I'm not sure that even all the groups that have an Islamic tinge to them, be they, be they Salafis or the Muslim Brotherhood or the younger factions that have broken away, whether they will all agree on just how far to go either. The younger generation, for example, opposes the, the older leadership, not only because it wasn't elected by the party itself, but also because it takes kind of antiquated uh, positions on the issue of women as president or Coptic Christians as president in the case of Egypt. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Gil Mahani, um, uh, the Muslim Brotherhood are now allowed to operate in political life. It looks like they're going to win the elections. Do you think the fact that they're not banned, they're not fighting anyone now, means that they are uh, less of a, a frightening prospect? Or do, do you, especially someone coming from Israel, are you still concerned about what's, what's going on? Yes, I'm concerned. And again, we don't know. Uh, there are many scenarios possible. The worst case scenario is not inevitable, but is relatively probable. The problems of Egypt are 100 times um, more complicated than Tunisia. Tunisia is a small, relatively small nation. There are 10 or 11 million. There are more than 80 million 
uh, Egyptians, literacy, um, uh, birth rate, uh, poverty, uh, create huge problems. Uh, the Israeli-Palestinian uh, issue is much more present than in, in Tunisia, and it's a very important element. Uh, and in Egypt, there is another question. We, we, we asked whether or not Islam is compatible, compatible with democracy. In Egypt, there is another very interesting question, whether or not being Egyptian means necessarily being Muslim or being Arab necessarily means being, mean being uh, Muslim because there aren't any Jews anymore in the Arab world and the Christians have a problem. And, uh, well, the Coptic Christians are said to be more danger now than ever before in history in the current situation in Egypt. They, 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 have, they have a problem and I think the problem is not only about uh, personal security. It's, it's a very profound question. What does it mean to be being Egyptian? What does it mean to be Arab? When there was a, a, a non-religious, the, the Arab identity was invented in a way uh, by minorities. They wanted to have something in common with the neighbors, which would go beyond religion. So there were more, many Christian bourgeoisie and intellectual that were pioneers of the Arab identity. The problem is that when you don't have the non-religious comp component, what do you have? What do, you, what do you have? What, what, can, what can replace Nasserism, Pan-Arabism, etc.? Of course, it's the idea of the, uh, the Islamic Ummah, of, of this common destiny, this huge community, which is more than a religious community. And, and this is a problem which is only theoretical in Tunisia, but it's very practical in Egypt. So Egypt is a really a very, very, a very, very tough case. Uh, there is another element which is very important is the, the role of the army. It's completely different from, from Tunisia. It's more like uh, maybe in Algeria or in, in, in Turkey. So it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a major Arab country, very, very important in the region, very unstable at the moment with a huge potential to create huge problems. Imagine just, you know, if they will have to close the canals, the, the Suez Canal for security reasons. It's, it's mm. I mean... The, the outcome could be incredible. Does Israel have any plans of, of how to deal with that in the future? Pray. <laughs> uh, Robin, I wonder if you'd like to come in and uh, respond to that. We're talking about the situation in Egypt. Well, um, you know, I think that Egypt is going to be the bellwether for the entire Arab world. Um, Tunisia is really important because that's where the Arab Spring began and that's where the first election was held. But Egypt has always been the intellectual heart and soul of um, the Arab world, the country, 22 countries, 300 million people. And so it will be far more important than, um, than any place else in determining. It accounts for one quarter of, um, of the Arab world today. So uh, the problem is, of course, the military has not followed through on any of its pledges, whether it's to lift emergency laws so there could be a really truly free and fair election or um, whether it's, you know, ending the kind of repression of, of critics of the military's role. And it's increasingly looking like a junta. And the danger is that even if people get out and vote for the parties they want, that the military is really looking during the writing of the Constitution and this transition that it's likely to play out over the next couple of years for guarantees that it ultimately is the real power. And so while we're worried about Islam and democracy, the role of the military is um, likely to be a determining factor in places like Egypt and, to a lesser degree, Tunisia. Um, I, I, mean, I just wanted to bring up another point. Are we, are we coming at, the, at this from the, the wrong angle, perhaps? Because these are uh, majority Muslim countries we're talking about. And is it not the case that in, while in Europe and America we've become used to a, a secular tradition, that uh, actually most Muslims do want their faith to pay a, play a part in their political life and that the, that doesn't necessarily mean bloodshed and violence? Do you think that there's something to that? Well, I think that now political Islam does not belong only to uh, or solely to Islamist parties. I mean, do the majority of Arab people want that Islam play a role in their daily life and the organization of politics from a moral point of view? Yeah, that's a kind of uh, identity corner that guarantee you that uh, some values of honesty, of social justice and so on will be respected. Where, where can but that be seen in the world at the moment, though? What, what countries can that kind of system be 
be seen? Where can we see that? Does it exist? Does it exist? Uh, no, that's why Tunisia is so interesting, actually, uh, as I said. Uh, but for example, if you look at Algeria, people who voted for the feast of the Islamic Salvage Front of Salvation in, in 1991 uh, didn't do so because, again, they were convinced by the political ideology of the feast, but much more because they were convinced by promises of change, and it was much more above all an anti-government vote. Uh, but if you go back to Algeria now, and even if the feast is authorized to come to, to make his comeback on the political scene, people won't vote for the fees anymore. So um, it, it, again, it's really a process. Uh, even, and even if people want to have Islam playing a part in, in their daily life, I think they, they, they do make the differentiation between uh, uh, Islam in their daily life from a moral point of view and on a kind of identity guarantee. And Islam within uh, institution, for example, if you, we are wondering what does Sharia mean now in Libya, in Tunisia, in Algeria, I mean, again, in Tunisia, if you take the example of, of, of Tunisia, previously it was Bernardi and Bourguiba who were deciding the place that Islam should have in the society. So they were not secular countries, they were not secular, secular systems. But now is the first time that Islam can be discussed freely. Uh, and you have also, we, are not, we didn't mention, for example, Salafism, but uh, the, what we are seeing from the West as an Islamist trait or as an Islamist novelty, political novelty, uh, is much more divided than what we are seeing. I mean, you have, for example, this, and also in Egypt, this huge Salafi wing, I mean, not that huge, but uh, again, much more important than uh, during uh, Ben Ali's rule, uh, who are just deeply anti-political. They don't want to talk about politics uh, because they are anti hezbi they are anti-party, so they don't want to talk about politics. They don't want to be involved in politics, but they want to be visible. And as you said, it, 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 uh, uh, a lot of, not attacks, but remarks on women and so on are occurring now in, Tunis and in Tunisia, and, and it was not the case. But it's also because people are freer than they were. <laughs> I mean, that could be choking. But that's also, uh, it's not just because about Islam. It's really about because of the political context that guarantee freedom and freedom of, of expression. Uh, but that's democracy, isn't it, Jalili? You have to allow people to say things that you might not necessarily agree with. And if there are people in Tunisia now saying that women should wear the burqa, but they're not in the majority, shouldn't they have the, the right to say that? Isn't that essentially what democracy yes, is? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, the, uh, actually, uh, I want to go back to the problem. I was thinking about the uh, the problem of identity, and this yes. uh, answers the, actually the problem of the identity because Tunisia, there's a problem of questioning the identity of Tunisians and the Arabs, and this links the two the two points. Uh, there's there's uh, now there's this burqa we're seeing on the streets in Tunisia, which we're not used to see. Uh, normally in Tunisia, we used to wear the uh, white veil, the safsari. So this is why people are afraid. They are afraid of uh, those Islamists coming from I don't know where. They are imposing things we are not used to see. This is not Tunisia. It is Tunisistan. So th those things are coming in the net, and people are really afraid, and it, it is like a paranoia. And this is why, why uh, yeah, the democracy, those people are boiling. They are afraid. But at the same time, and Nahda, this political party uh, uh, saying that it is a, uh, a party, uh, a moderate party, should explain to people what is uh, what is next how 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 will tunisia be what is the shape what is the tunisian identity in the future right, because what as we've said they are the first country to try this out everybody's looking at tunisia because it was the first country to do this yeah and 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 this is the the uh, the uh, the biggest and the uh, the biggest step actually it's not elections in itself this is like i, I like the uh, the way that the cons the uh, the, cons uh, the, uh, the constitution uh, the constitution it will be i mean uh, the assembly is made of because it's like 40 percent another the rest 60% is other parties. It's like a nice mosaic of like 10%. So a 10%. proportional representation system. Yes, yes, that's good. But I wish that they can come close together so that they don't push to the extremism. I mean, if Nahda uh, will, be, will, will be taken by ext its extreme part and the others, the liberals, will take, uh, I mean, will push to the extreme, then Tunisia will be lost. So that, now the, the, uh, the exercise is a negotiating exercise so that we put Tunisia in the center and in the, uh, in the path, as we say. All right. Yeah. Uh, if I go back to a point we were making earlier, we're really at the heart of this debate about the, the religion of Islam and democracy and about whether or not the two are compatible because if historically democracy has been absent from from muslim countries and i wondered if you uh, perhaps think that there's something about the religion and the way it is that 
means it, it's difficult, it's awkward to, to bring religion uh, and democracy together. Yes, it is. It was uh, difficult everywhere. Um, <clears throat> the, the, the problem, or the problem, I mean, the, the challenge is that um, to remember that uh, real democracy, I mean, the only democracy that counts, liberal democracy, has two, two elements. First of all, there is the procedure that, uh, uh, that um, gives the power to the majority through elections and all this kind of stuff. But then there's the other one, there are the values. What actually the list of things that even the majority cannot do. Uh, democracy is not the, dict the dictatorship of the majority. Mm -hmm. It's more than that. And of course it's very easy for, for, the, um, for uh, Islamic uh, political structures to accept the majority side. Democracy is the rule of the majority. It's a lot more complicated, it takes a lot more time to accept that even as a majority, there are certain rights that you just cannot touch, even if you have 99%. Cer certain things are above and beyond what any regime can do. And this is very difficult because when you come from a re religious thinking uh, framework, you deal with absolute truth. And the problem in democracy is that everything is only an opinion. Only an opinion, which means that doubt and the possibility that the one in front is telling the truth is, is an essential part of, political, political, of, of the political culture of democracy. And I think that people that come from a religious thinking uh, uh, tradition, they are in the West. What happened in the West is that the only way that they were convinced that it, the, its opinion and not truth is they try to kill the other. And only when they failed, they say, okay, let's live together. And I just hope that in the Arab world, they will not have to go through all this. Right, we're running out of time, Amel. I just uh, wanted to bring you in finally with the no, last one. I on think that. that's really what, what uh, just to jump on, jump, jump on that, I think that's really one of main, the main Nahda's interests and challenge for the future. Uh, and they have been able to remobilize a lot of people, segments of the population that were not interested or did, did not feel concerned uh, with politics. So now the real danger is that, okay, they have remobilized these people and they have involved them into politics, but they should not do it in a, in a clientelistic way. It's not about, okay, we got your votes and now we are going to do our own things. No, they should, be, they should continue to involve people in a pluralistic uh, landscape. All right, Amel, uh, Boubaka, I'm sorry, we've run okay. out of time, Jalila, I'm very sorry. Jalila Hedley Penier, uh, Gil Mahaili, uh, Amel Boubacar, and in Washington, Robin Wright. Thanks very much indeed to all of you. And thanks to you for watching. We'll be back at the same time tomorrow with another debate. This is France 24.